Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to welcome the president of Drexel University, John Fry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Drexel. It's great to have so many good friends and colleagues here. Uh, I want to give a, a special uh, word of thanks to my friends David Lipson and Tom McGrath and that amazing, amazing staff from Philadelphia Magazine who put this all together. Let's give them a hand. So, so the thesis for my presentation is how actually are we going to make Philadelphia a world-class city? And I think that um, this actually has nothing to do with the assets that we have in Philadelphia right now. I think we have world-class assets. I think what we don't have is world-class collaboration or world-class teamwork or world-class connective tissue, if you will. And so I think of this task as the task of actually building a new neighborhood in Philadelphia, both from a cultural standpoint as well as from a physical standpoint. So what I'm going to talk about is the, the sort of physical manifestation of what a lot of was probably talked about in terms of people and program in the earlier presentations. And I, I guess the way I put this whole thing together was actually to look at uh, the agenda that was put together and um, try to derive um, some inspiration from that. So this neighborhood that I'm talking about will have um, experiential learning, as Nick Baer talked about this morning. It'll have hospitality and sports and entertainment, the sort of spirit of what Christina talked about. It'll be uh, anchored by Eds and Meds, what Steve Clasco and, and Steve Altshuler uh, were interviewed by uh, Zeke Emanuel before. Um, the creative economy, particularly the entrepreneurial economy, that is uh, so well represented by my friend Keith Leapard and Replica and the great work that they do there, will have a place in this new neighborhood. Um, Amy talked about innovation and technology and, and development and the, the huge difference that Penn makes uh, throughout uh, West Philadelphia and in our city, and that should be represented in this new neighborhood. Uh, Philly schools, uh, and you know, Bill is, is fighting a very good fight in terms of the things that ha have to be done, but there'll be a school, a K through eight, um, neighborhood public school as part of this, this neighborhood. Um, the making of a world-class city, which is AJ's topic, really speaks to the internationalization of Philadelphia and what we will do in this new neighborhood to achieve that. Um, the, the one I stumbled on is pot is coming. Be <laughs> well, because no Drexel student smokes marijuana, so I didn't really sort of know, know what to do with that, or at least so I'm told. Um, Building for Innovation, which was what Karen just talked about, the, the Comcast Tower is sort of part and parcel of this sort of innovation neighborhood idea. Um, Emma's, um, Emma's message just now was so positive, and I think that you know, this is taking all that we love about Philadelphia and, and beginning to aggregate it. Uh, and finally, uh, it is about uniting the city, which is what your next speaker, um, Alex Rice, is gonna talk about. And um, Alex, I'm happy to report, is a 2002 graduate of Drexel University, a real point of pride. So let me, um, let me just fly through then my, my presentation. Um, I wanna just give you a sense of, of what, what the landscape looks like right now. This is the Philadelphia Central Business District, so you have your orientation here. Um, $8.5 billion of completed uh, or under construction or pre-development activity since January of 2013, so clearly we are investing in ourselves. Uh, over the past 20 years, we've converted a lot of space uh, for residential and hotel demand, uh, and you can see it's the th third largest downtown population in the country, about 11,000 uh, hotel rooms. Um, this is the, the really good news for us, the highest growth rate of millennials of any major U.S. city, seven straight years, 45% of downtown residents have college degrees, 21% graduate degrees. I wanna then look on the west side of, of the city. I'm not gonna go through these points, but if you take a look at the amazing uh, assets with uh, Amtrak, with the University of Pennsylvania, with the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, with CHOP, with the University of City Science Center, you see the critical mass uh, of activity and, and assets that I talked about before. Uh, maybe a few words about Drexel. In the past five years, we've done about 1.6 million feet of research and academic and residential uh, space, about $580 million worth of value. Uh, we're a top 100 American research university. We have a budget of a slightly under a billion dollars, 26,000 um, students and a, over, a little over 10,000 employees. And so we take our place among all those other major eds and meds as well. Uh, I'm not gonna go through these accomplishments other than to point out maybe the fourth point. We've had 
$260 million of third-party investment in our campus, in this case from a Texas-based company called American Campus Communities. I'll show you some images about that, but that's $260 million of outside investment in our city. That is a major vote of confidence, at least in our campus and, and I think in Philadelphia. And so we'll talk about how to generate more of that in the future. Um, just some of, the, some of the work product. We have a beautiful um, integrated sciences building on the corner of 33rd and Chestnut, named after my uh, predecessor, Konstantin Papadakis. You are in actually what is the first building in the innovation neighborhood, the LeBeau College of Building, uh, finished last year uh, in September of 13. Uh, our urban center at 3501 Market. This is the famous Robert Venturi decorated shed from 1987. It is now the home of our Westfall College of Media Arts and Design. Uh, this is one of the American Campus Communities uh, projects. It's a $98 million, 870-bed, uh, 20,000-foot retail project using other people's money on Chestnut between 33rd and 32nd. My undying claim to fame with my uh, undergraduates is that it has uh, the second Shake Shack in the city and the first Shake Shack in University City. <laughs> so that, that forever uh, seals my legacy. University Crossings uh, is uh, the old Conrail building. It's being renovated at about $30 million. It has about 1,100 beds. We actually now have ownership of the, uh, the ground and the air rights on that. In the foreground, you will see the world's most expensive tire repair facility, um, <laughs> which we just purchased. Uh, I won't tell you the price because it pains me to say so. But this actually figures prominently into this innovation neighborhood plan as well. Uh, if you go up a little bit west at 34th and Lancaster, uh, this will open in September of 15, the summit, and again, $170 million investment by American campus communities. It's the largest uh, building we've built to date on the Drexel campus. It'll house 1,300 of my students. It'll have a little over 20,000 feet of retail. Uh, it'll, it'll begin to anchor the resurgence of Lancaster Avenue. Um, and I want to talk to you about housing that's other than Drexel housing at this point, because we have three really exciting market rate projects which really are targeted towards millennials. millennials and, and I think this is, this is because the market is demanding this. And so music to our ears at Drexel and Penn, after all the investments that we've made, it's really nice to see the market step up. Jerry Sweeney is doing uh, Evo. It'll, uh, it opened in August of 2014. Beautiful design, 850 beds. Uh, uh, walk a little bit north, the 36th and Market, uh, the Science Center's first residential project with the Southern Land Company. Uh, and that'll be about um, 28 stories another 15,000 feet of retail, walk a few uh, blocks further west, uh, right next to the Episcopal Cathedral. Uh, Dave Yeager is doing 3737 uh, Chestnut, and you can see all the amenities in that building. That's just the market responding to the things that are happening in University City, again, uh, anchoring our residential uh, neighborhoods as well as the academic neighborhoods. Uh, this is a great project by Penn at 33rd uh, and Chestnut, the new college house. Um, let's then talk a little bit about academic and commercial uh, and, um, and healthcare, uh, Penn Presbyterian up at 38th um, uh, Street and uh, right off of Market, this pavilion for advanced care. Uh, 3737 Market is built by the Science Center for Penn. Uh, it's a big research building that just opened. Uh, a little bit of infill retail on uh, 39th and Walnut uh, right off the Penn campus. Uh, and then uh, the big project, the FMC Tower at 30th and Walnut, again, a brand new wine product. Um, and I'll, I'll finish with sort of two amenities to come. Uh, the study at University City, uh, 211 Keys, opens in 2016. Uh, the second product of its kind uh, as part of the Hospitality 3 chain, a terrific thing. And then we'll have finally a decent, uh, um, a, a decent K through eight public school um, in the side of University City. We purchased the um, University City High School site. It's being um, in the process of demolished and uh, demolition rather, and uh, we'll have a K through eight school there. And then lastly, um, a child care and mixed use property at 32nd and race, which is a sort of God forsaken part of our campus, which should be enlivened by this project here. And, and so um, I wanna finish by saying, that's just University City. Go, go uh, east from where we are right now. You know, Karen talked about what the Comcast Innovation Center is gonna be look like, looking like and, and, and all the other activity that's happening in Center City. You aggregate this. I didn't even have time to, to put all those numbers together. That is a huge amount of investment in our city. So you know, we, have, we have the people assets and we have the physical assets. So how do we connect this whole thing? Uh, my proposition is that we begin to think of ourselves as an innovation district. Um, and so innovation districts, and this is work from the Brookings Institution. I'll give you the reference on the study in a second. Uh, geographic areas where anchor institutions and companies cluster together, come together, 
uh, with small firms, startups, incubators, accelerators, uh, and, and begin to establish that kind of neighborhood identity. This is a place to go if you're an entrepreneur, if you want to start things up, if you want to get things done, if you need funding, uh, if you need co-op students, wherever you are, they should be in, in, in close hand. Um, physically compact, uh, transit accessible, I'll talk a lot about transit later, um, and technically wired, uh, of course, to mixed-use housing, retail, um, and, um, and uh, uh, recreational as well. Um, there are different sort of innovation district models. Think of us as Anchor Plus. Uh, and I would also say, given the, uh, the rail yard project that I'll talk about as well, uh, as a reimagined uh, urban area. And so we're, we'd probably check two of these three boxes here. Um, so what, what, what do innovation districts do? What's the, what's the proposition that they'll bring to Philadelphia? Uh, it'll help us, I think, build a collaborative uh, leadership network, and, and we need that. We, we still operate in too many silos uh, in this region. We really need to now become more than the sum of our parts, and, and, and we need both leadership to do that. We also need aggregation of, of assets and, and collaboration to achieve that, uh, which, is, which is something I think we can absolutely do. We need to set a vision for growth. That's ambition. That is, is moving away from wringing our hands about all the things that we don't like in Philadelphia and fixing them for a change and then moving this whole thing forward. Uh, pursuing talent and technology, which we have, I believe, in abundance, but we can have a lot more if we become a magnet. Uh, promoting inclusive growth. This is extremely important to Drexel. If, if, if all we do with this innovation neighborhood is build another island of privilege in Philadelphia, then shame on us. We sit next to one of five promise zones designated by President Obama earlier this year in America, only three of which are in cities, and that is the promise zone in Mantua. If we do our work right, this innovation district and all the activity and, and vitality and economic promise should also uh, impact in a positive way what's happening in really distressed neighborhoods like Mantua. Uh, and then lastly, hopefully enhanced access to capital. With that critical mass will come more capital, will become you know, more ideas, which will be get more capital. And so we, we really need to pull this together. This is the, this is the report that, that, uh, that uh, Bruce and Julie had done. I would really commend this to all of you. This is a, a, a great read uh, for those of you who are interested in, in this kind of thing. Here is our University City Anchor Plus model uh, as portrayed by, um, by Brookings. And you know, Amy talked about the UPenn Innovation and Research Park. Um, you know, Josh Koppelman, first round capital. You see all the institutions uh, that you know something about. This is the beginning of the aggregation, at least on the west side of the city. And so this innovation neighborhood is what I want to talk to you about specifically, because you've know, you got to start somewhere. I think we need to look at Philadelphia as an innovation district, both Center City and University City, united by the river. But I also think we need a, a core to start with. And, and my proposition is that we look at 30th to 32nd market to JFK and, and call that the down payment on a larger innovation district. So we call this the innovation neighborhood. Um, this, is, um, this is a series of parking lots. Um, and warehouse buildings, and a lot of those stuff that frankly uh, leaves a lot to be desired, uh, both aesthetically and functionally, but it can yield 5.0 million, uh, um, 5 million square feet of development on a little over 10 acres. Very dense, very compact, uh, and located next to the third busiest passenger rail station in the United States, uh, 4.1 million people coming through 30th Street Station. You take a look at that, that opportunity, and it's a big opportunity because of its adjacency to the Eds and Meds, to Center City, to the river, to the train station for Amtrak and SEPTA. So this is, this is our, our value proposition. You know, this is what the innovation neighborhood will, will do. It'll accomplish all these things. This is not an innovation neighborhood for Drexel only. What we would love to do is, is, is of course, enjoy further expansion of our institution, but we would like to invite all comers in so long as they're devoted um, to the art and science of innovation. Big companies, small companies, healthcare organizations, other educational organizations, residences, retail, recreational, and open space. Let's really make this a neighborhood, not for Drexel, but for everyone. Um, I want to just give you a couple views. Uh, there's, some, um, there's some images here. Um, you have a not the most inspiring view up Market Street West from 31st. We could do that uh, if we put our mind to it. And then if you go to JFK Boulevard, um, this is what you see when you come out of the third busiest passenger rail station in the city. There's the bolt bus and the mega bus and <laughs> a, bunch of, a bunch of really you know, bad vending going on and a bunch of parking lots and low rise buildings. Uh, that is not something to write home about. This is something to write home about, uh, which 
which again, you, have, you know, you have all this vacant land in the fifth largest city in the country next to this train station. This should be able to be done. Um, so let, let me talk about um, the innovation neighborhood is, is sort of what I just described, 30th to 32nd market to JFK. Then there's the, the whole area beyond that, which is the, uh, the SEPTA and Amtrak rail yards. But I want to talk a little bit about Amtrak, which turns out to be one of the great assets that we have in the Philadelphia region. So it's about 900 route miles that the Northeast Corridor uh, travels, about half are owned by Amtrak, two thirds are electrified. This is really complicated. You got eight commuter operators, you got six freight operators, you got 2,200 daily trains, 260 million annual passenger trips, 1,200 bridges, and these are old bridges, and in many cases, pretty decrepit. So this, this is complicated, and, and, and Amtrak's job is, is complicated. Um, the Northeast region is projected to grow. Look at that growth, it's amazing. But the stations are operating at or near capacity. We've got major structural problems. Uh, you have shifting demographics, and so people want walkable communities. They want to take the train. They don't want to go to the airport. You know, they want to ride their bikes. They want to walk. They want to have mass transit. Um, and and highway and airport um, expansion is just not going to be sufficient um, to do the do the job. And it's it's also very expensive and environmentally difficult at times. Uh, so there's a lot of passenger frustration, as as many of you know, uh, because of the crowding that's going on. But the market still votes anyway for rail over air. I mean, take a look at this Washington New York air rail market. Um, you know, we, we've done a, a complete flip. It used to be airline 63, Amtrak 37. Now it's 76 to 24 the other way. So, so people want this stuff. They want this kind of transportation amenity. It, it makes getting to New York and to Washington, um, you know, a, a, a pretty easy thing. And then when you think about what this area could look like if we had high-speed rail. So if you look at the France, Paris to Marseille, and Japan, um, th these are high-speed rail connections between um, one city to the other on either end, you know, I mean, imagine how many people they're moving back and forth on high-speed rail. Look at the job we're doing without high-speed rail with, in some cases, much more density and still getting all those people through. So if we're to get high-speed rail to come to um, the, the Northeast Corridor, uh, New York, uh, I'm sorry, Philadelphia to New York, 38 minutes, Philadelphia to Washington, one hour. Talk about being on the 50-yard line of the Eastern Seaboard. now. High-speed rail is a complicated thing, it's an expensive thing, it's a political thing. But if we have the will as a country and a region to get this done, Philadelphia is sitting right in, in the best place possible. And that is one of our great competitive advantages, is having this transportation network. Um, you can see some of the commercial growth in this, this area that's, that's predicted with this innovation neighborhood. So when we talk to Amtrak about studying the feasibility of taking advantage of all the air rights over about 85 acres, of, of, of rail yards, um, some of which have trains on them, so they would need to be platforms, some of which are open space, which could be reutilized. I think they saw the potential that uh, such a development could have. As long term as it is, the question has to be asked, can you take those, that massive rail yard and, and, and figure out how to derive a lot of value beyond the transportation value that it provides? Uh, we have a planning process. I'm not going to go through the, the details of this mercifully for you. but. Uh, <laughs> It, it's it, the, the four major partners are Amtrak, SEPTA, Brandywine Realty Trust, uh, and Drexel. We're the four major landowners. We have a great coordinating committee. We've hired Skidmore Owens and Merrill to, to put the whole process uh, together for us. In about two years, we'll have a sense of how feasible this is, and, and if it is feasible, how expensive it'll be. Um, this is the study area. We're looking at both sides of the river. We're particularly looking at Schuylkill um, exits uh, into 30th Street Station, that whole mess, and then also the whole traffic pattern around 30th Street Station, which you know, don't go by there about five or six at night because you'll, you'll be sitting there and, and observing everything for about an hour. Um, and so let me just end with this. Um, this is the fifth largest city in America. You, you're, flying over, you're flying over it in a helicopter. You're looking down and you're asking yourself, you know, why is there such a big hole in this donut? Why is there 85 acres of, of, of underutilized space in the middle that could be converted into the second phase, if you will, of this innovation neighborhood. This is a phenomenal opportunity that very few, if any, cities have, particularly given the transportation access. And so I look at this picture, and I look at that picture, and look how close it is to the parkway. I mean, this is so close to the parkway where these amazing cultural uh, assets are. So I look at those two pictures, and I think of this picture, um, which is just a picture, but, but it, 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 is, it, is, it does say something about the possibilities that we have here. And so I am really for, at, at, at this point, declaring that we need to take all these amazing, amazing assets that we, that we have and that we love in Philadelphia 
aggregating them, building a new, new neighborhood, and using that as a nucleus to build out other neighborhoods as well. So thanks for your time, nice to be here.